something very important to, said, to be said about it. And I have to move, unfortunately, over there, otherwise I cannot move the slides. So the thing that I want to talk to, uh, about today, and you have to... Is this better? Yes. Okay. Um, the thing that I want to... Put you sit down because the people behind you can't see. Well, actually... Oh, okay. Do you want someone to cue it for yeah. you? Yeah. Yes, actually. That, yes, that was it. Let well, somebody so sit you know, there, and then when you say, they'll yeah. you can, That way you can stay up the front. You can stay up at the front, Father, so we yes. can see you. Um, that, that assumes that I know what the next slide is. <laughs> you can glance you can at it. <laughs> yeah. No, I have a friend out here. Um, so the thing that I want to talk to guy, uh, about today is um, St. Alexander Schmorro. And... This is a picture of him. Um, uh, actually, it was taken uh, while he was at the university uh, in studying in Munich. Um, and you see his life as he was born on uh, uh, September 16, 1917, and he died a mature death on July 13, 1943. That tells you a little bit what time frame we're actually talking about. Next slide. First, I'd, I would like to introduce you to a couple basic dates. So he was born on um, September 16, 1917, and he was actually born in Russia. And um, his father was Hugo Schmorl, who was a German. But uh, his father was actually living uh, his whole life, basically, in Russia. So he felt certainly more, in, in many aspects, more as, as a Russian than he was feeling as a German. And his uh, mother was Natalia. Uh, no, it's the Russian speakers. How do you pronounce that? Lydia Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, she was actually, she was Russian, and uh, she was the daughter of a priest. And she died in 1919 on typhus. Um, and if you see at the birth date and uh, uh, when she died, you know that he was only two years old at that time when she died. Uh, his father remarried, and he married actually a German in 1920, and it, uh, her name was Elizabeth Hoffman. Uh, Elizabeth Hoffman, uh, as said, she was German. Um, but also it had the same uh, uh, fate as his father, uh, that they basically were living their whole life up to that point in Russia. Father, can I interrupt you? Yes. Uh, if you notice, he was born in Edinburgh, that's the Urals. There were large German colonies scattered all over Russia. Germans used to come and work in Russia. If you know, starting with Peter the Great, there were uh, German colonies. So just to explain why a German and non-Orthodox person would be living all his life in Russia, there were German colonies. For farming, right? Like the wheat? Excuse me? Was it like for the wheat and all that? Because the wheat was very good? Which time? The wheat. Wheat. Was it like for ah. farming? <laughs> um, and yeah, actually, I should probably say something about this um, because his father was not Orthodox, but his mother was, and uh, he was baptized Orthodox uh, um, uh, um, as a child. Um, in uh, 1921, uh, his family had to flee the Bolshevik, and um, and his nanny um, was actually going with them, and so they had settled uh, finally in Munich. Um, his new wife, Elizabeth Hoffman, she was Roman Catholic, um, and all his siblings later were also the, uh, Roman Catholics. But she took uh, actually quite, she took this very seriously that Alexander was Orthodox, and uh, she was actually taking care that he is going to uh, an Orthodox churches, uh, churches uh, and services. Uh, she also took care of that he is getting an Orthodox religious education. Um, so, uh, although she was not Orthodox, she took this very seriously. Um, uh, that the nanny uh, came with her, um, there's a little, uh, uh, a nice uh, side story to that. Um, she actually came under a pretense with them. Um, and they, she came under with a pretense that she is actually
actually the widow of Hugo Schmalz, his father's brother. Um, and this is why, if you're looking actually for her grave, uh, she is buried under the name Francisca Schmorl, but that was not her name. She was never related to them. Um, so there were here two additional, uh, um, there were two additional uh, uh, siblings, uh, two additional uh, kids out of the second marriage. Um, one was uh, Eric, and the other one was Natasha. Um, in uh, he started to study medicine uh, in 1939, and he started to do this first in Hamburg, uh, at the university there, but uh, moved fairly to, uh, shortly, uh, 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 soon after that, a year later, um, to Munich, and continued his studies uh, at the University of Munich in what is called the Ludwig Maximilian University. So if you'll never figure this out, I'm German. So, <laughs> um, uh, next slide. <clears throat> well, why is this all so important? Well, he became part of the group, what is in German called the Die Weiße Rose, what in, in English it translates to the White Rose. And you normally, if you're looking, uh, actually, if you're going onto the internet and looking up the White Rose, um, uh, you will um, sometime now after the glorification of Saint Alexander to Ashmore, you will find more references to him. But um, unfortunately, in the history, in the uh, younger history after that, it was pretty driven by two people um, that were very well known, and that were the the, the, the siblings Hans Scholl and Sophie Scholl. Um, and so sometimes you find only references to them. But um, uh, this group was much bigger than only these two siblings. And of course, uh, um, uh, these, all, these, uh, all these people of this uh, particular group, um, uh, I would not even say that one was more important than the other. Um, it, what was so remarkable of, out of, from this group, that they actually worked really like, as, almost like as one mind. They were driven by one, one particular thing. So part of the, the key persons of this group, um, the first one is Christoph Probst, and I put pictures from them up uh, that I found. Um, so the other one is Hans Scholl, then his sister Sophie Scholl, um, then Willy Graf, then there is a uh, professor who was actually te teaching philosophy uh, at the University of Munich, uh, Munich Professor Dr. Kurt Huber. And, uh, and, of course, Alexander Schmorl. Um, well, how did they know each other? Um, the first thing that you have to know, that Christoph Probst and Alexander Schmorl were childhood friends. They knew, them, uh, knew and were very much acquainted from each other from, from childhood. And the, it happens to be that they both actually started medicine in Munich. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so they had, they had already similar ideas uh, uh, of how life should be, uh, and, and similar ideas about what they are called later Freiheit, or you, what it's a very bad translation because this word is being used in a in a very different way today about liberty. But what I will tell Eric soon, what they're actually talking about liberty. It's not what we are understanding about uh, today, what liberty actually is. Um, so, and then there is Hans Scholl. Um, well, Alexander Schmorl and Hans Scholl, they made their acquaintances in, 19, in June 1941. And they actually learned quickly that they had very common interests. Then Willy Graf was part of the, uh, uh, was also part of this friendship circle. Sophie Scholl, the sister of Hans Scholl, um, she became part of the uh, circle in May uh, 1942, and it was after she actually moved to study biology and philosophy. Uh, remember that combination. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, biology and philosophy also at the University of Munich. She was studying at a different university before. We actually do not quite know uh, this, uh, when she already knew what this group is actually doing, and uh, when she because uh, she must have known about it much, uh, much more before, because she got into this uh, almost like in the inner cycle of the white rose right from the get go after she moved uh, to Munich. So that she must have already been familiar about it. Um, professor Dr. Kurt Hoover, um, he, well, he is a quite an interesting professor, an inter interesting person. So he, as I said, he uh, was teaching philosophy at the university. And, um, and he was not agreeing with that what was currently happening, especially when it came to teaching. So if you're going nowadays to school, uh, or even if you're going to college, well, if you have a different opinion about something, um, are you allowed to voice that opinion? Yeah. Okay. Well, yes. at that time, that was certainly not the case. In Germany. Yes, in Germany. <laughs> in Germany, that was not the case. You could not voice your different opinion. You could not even talk to anyone about that. And as a matter of fact, even the professors of the... Uh, Nowadays, yes, a teacher has, uh, has, a, has a plan what he wants to teach you. And he, he's being told what the goal should be at the end of the, the semester, semester or at the end of the school year, what you should have learned. And that is a good way to do that. But he's not necessarily been told in absolutely detail how he has to achieve that. And that was very different at that time. He was told in absolutely detail how that is being done. And it was not so much about... Um, the subject matter of the, uh, of biology or the something it was actually teaching you uh, how to think in uh, in uh, in this country regime in the Nazi regime that is uh, how you should have a thought that was always the underlying topic on that. You are aware mm -hmm. who was running Germany at the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I never mentioned Mustache. it, and I took it for granted that you know that. I hope you had, all have had history lessons enough that you know what is happening at that time. <clears throat> so, um, being a philosophy professor and that in such an environment is really a challenge. Because what you are trying normally to teach is all the philosophies that ever occurred and how, how people were thinking. And that might be very different of that what you what you currently experience outside there. So he had to be actually very careful. And originally he was not a member of the Nazi party of the NS. Uh, in Germany we uh, uh, pronounce NSDAP, the National so 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 Socialistic uh, Democratic Party. Um, and uh, so he was not a member of that. That had actually a consequence for him. He hardly, he never got uh, got any. Uh, he did not get a permanent position at the uh, university. Um, so party membership was required for that. And uh, and then the few hours that he got, he was very paid very little and could hardly survive on that money. Well, he eventually actually became a party member just for the sake to get a teaching position. Um, and he got that teaching position, but that does not really change the, his thinking. He still did not agree with what was going on there. So his students actually report, if you read this then, is that he was very, very creative how he actually worded different ideas in his teaching. And he did this in a very a creative, in a very... Um, uh, 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 um, yeah, in a very creative way, so that he uh, that he got his message across with, without being saying it directly into your face. There is a lot that it, that requires a lot of skill to do that, because you also have to remember that during these lessons, you basically at that time of the uh, 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 at that time you had to if you were not agreeing with someone you. Everyone around you, you had to assume he is your enemy. He will listen in to you, 
And if you do, uh, say something that is not agreeing, he will report it. And that was especially true for teachers. And there were actually even party members sitting just into the lectures to watch what they were what they are teaching. And philosophy is, of course, a prime example for that, that they would do that. So he was very uh, creative in doing that. And um, so here you have the whole, um, uh, the whole group of the white rose that I would say the key persons, the, the core group, it actually grew a little bit later on uh, uh, after they had started their actions. So, and you see the first key on that is this was actually a group founded on friendship. Uh, yes, it was, uh, it, it was founded and, and this friendship uh, uh, was glued together that they had actually a common uh, idea behind that, that they were not agreeing what was currently going on. And I have to tell you, they knew this firsthand. It was not just only that they were sitting and listening to, uh, to that and all of this. No, Alexander Schmorl and Hans Scholl, uh, for example, they actually were sent into, uh, uh, into, they were part of the military, they were actually um, uh, uh, medical staff. Um, and uh, there were, there were uh, uh, Alexander Schmoll was uh, when the preoccupation uh, of Austria happened. He was part of that. He was, it was in there. He actually went to Russia. He, went, he was in Stalingrad. And, it, and, when they, and that was mandatory assignment. That was not something that they were, uh, could wave off and say, I'm not doing this. Yes, there were students, but they were male. They needed them. Here you go. There was a mandatory draft, and they went. And, well, especially when they were in Stalingrad, um, they, they realized something, and especially like Sander Schmoll realized something, and he had an advantage because he was not only speaking German, he was speaking Russian fluently. So he actually could connect to the local people there and could talk to them. And he did so, although that was highly forbidden. He should have not done that, but he did, he did anyway. And he found something out that it, he saw firsthand that there was mass killing going on. Not only on the German side, there were was, there was 230, about 230,000 Germans were being lost in Stalingrad. There were over millions of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Russians lost today. And he came, and if that does not get, get you an impression when you're coming back, well, I do not know what will. <laughs> so they came back, and they were actually affirmed in that what they had already started doing. Next slide. They were not content with just thinking something has to happen. They understood their parent, yes? Well, it could, I, I think maybe in history books that people, of course, have heard about Hitler, but the White Rose is probably not in there. Could you, in a kind of a brief sentence, say what was their philosophy? What did White Rose... That's what I'm coming out to. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. So, <laughs> sorry, there's a long introduction to that, but to the core, but it actually helped. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so... Their parents probably did, uh, uh, did not even agree what, is, what was going on. But they finally said, well, just thinking that something that, uh, that should not happen is just not enough. And just in our heads that they're not agreeing is not enough. We have to do something. And they did a very brave thing. They, they authored, they, they wrote down flyers. And explained in these flyers what they actually were thinking of and what the Germans should actually do. They there were in total six flyers that they wrote. These flyers were written 
on typewriters. <laughs> and they were uh, copied, well, how do you copy nowadays? Well, well probably don't even use the Xerox machines anymore. You just go onto the computer and hit print 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You put them yes. Well, the carbon copy, but what they actually used, that, uh, and I will show you later how that looks like, uh, they used a, a, a system called hectography, uh, where it's uh, not being used anymore. Only the old uh, people at the, in school that uh, they have to have some age that know probably how, how that looked like. Um, but they. Um, we're still looking at the other Um, they, in, in these flyers, they wrote down what they're observing, what is currently happening, and what they're thinking that what, what is, has to happen. Like in the second, in the second flyer, uh, I, I put this just in the, uh, up there to see how they actually look like, so that I have a visual impression of that. But like in the second flyer, um, they... They, they, for example, said actually now I have to, what is the English word for national socialism? National socialism? Is that how you translate it? National socialism? What's the word? National socialism? Not, uh, the German word is national socialism. Yeah. Nazism. 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 Is that what it's called? Okay. Um, so they're saying um, you cannot think about Nazism in a spiritual way or just in your mind because Nazism is not spiritual. That is how the second flyer actually started. started. Alone for that, you would, could get arrested. Alone for that sentence. Then later on they're saying, well, it is not given to us to give a final um, judgment on that what is currently happening and what about the sense of history what is currently happening. But if this catastrophe that is currently happening in our country shall Used, shall be used to our salvation, then it is only because we, we, we will be purified by, um, by penance, by, um, by sorrow, by... Um, Only because we are sorrowful, because we're going through all this pain, this is the, that would be the only reason that this is currently happening. Uh, what is important about this paragraph is that a uh, paragraph was um, it, it tells you that they actually were, although they were not all orthodox, but they actually uh, approached that what is currently happening also in a spiritual way. They looked at this at the at the bigger outlook on that, but what that actually causes for us. It's not only causing catastrophe and people dying, and that is of course all that that, that that's in itself is already reason enough not to agree what is currently happening. And there are other flies where they're actually telling that, like on the point. It is not acceptable anymore that we killing a, a millions of, a, of other people, that our own people, 230,000 people, are dying on the uh, uh, in, in war. It is not acceptable. So they were very bland, they were very direct about what is currently going on, and they are actually going into history um, with, uh, with, with something that is, um, that is quite remarkable. They are the only, the only German resistance group that in a flyer and a publicly, with that publicly, actually voiced the Holocaust that were happening against the Jews. Wow. There were 
many resistance groups out, uh, out there, but they were not Germans. But there were Germans, and they said so. It is wrong what is going on. And that particular paragraph was authored by Alexander Schmorowski. So they were very blunt, very direct about what is going on. So what did they do with these flyers? Well, they actually really took stack of the flyers and were distributing them first all over Munich. They were dropping them in streets so that people could pick them up, dropping them in, 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 in walkways or in, in entryways of houses. They're actually even what you would call nowadays graffitis. They're graffiti walls. And of course, that was all done in secrecy during the night so that it uh, hopefully didn't get caught. Um, the next slide. Well, they literally, as I said, used typewriters. And they wanted to, because you're sitting all on a computer, I want to show you how a typewriter looks like. It's not. It's not an electric thing. It's a very manual thing. And if you want to copy something, well, you actually use that special paper down there. It's called a transfer paper. And funny enough, I found out today, there is one use nowadays. You can still buy transfer paper. And there is a very interesting use to that. Tattoo powers you use. Hmm? Tattoo palace, I use Tattoo, tattoo. Oh, <laughs> tattoo. Tattoo palace. Did we call that mimeograph? We called it a mimeograph. Yeah. That's, That's right, they do use that. Mimeograph. Yeah. <laughs> so you put it in the typewriter. You probably never even heard the word, though. <laughs> probably not anymore. I've seen a typewriter, <laughs> but not that. No, you, uh, you use that for uh, on the typewriter, then you mimeograph it. Yes, exactly. You put it on the drum there, you put some fluid on it. Uh, and then you'd run the paper through it, and you hand crank that. Alone, and not only that this is extreme manual labor. It's not that hard. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is manual labor. Yeah. But they had to write it, and, uh, and plus they had to write it actually a couple times because these, these transfer uh, things, they're wearing out. You cannot use them uh, constantly. And then, the, uh, and actually, that was already a progress that they actually had the machine. For the first flights, they didn't have a, 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 a machine like that. They literally typed them every time. They didn't even have the, the carbon copies, like not the carbon copy paper. They had to write them by hand every flight. Didn't we call it stencil paper? No? It was called stencil paper in the mimeograph. I don't and remember that word. Mimeographs, I remember, because they would they'd come off a little warm. When, the, the, when, when I was in school, they, they, they had a fragrance. They have a special fragrance that's they're kind of usually a, a kind of a bluish color print, and they have a, a, a special fragrance to them. But it, so that's, you, you, they went to this, and, but the, the other thing that probably you don't you don't know about it. Alone, the possession of such a machine was bad. Was an offense if it was not being approved, because that this is a total regime. They want to have control about everything what you're doing, and so certainly don't you, you, they don't want that you're copying something and distributing that. So alone to have the in possession to be in possession of that particular machine was an offense. Next picture. Uh, next slide. Well, what really happened then in the end was they get, did get caught. One of the bravest things that they were, and the, and the last things that they actually did was um, they were distributing these flyers in the uh, University of Munich directly. And I'll show you. A couple of pictures how this university, where they distributed these flies, how that looks like now to give you a visual on that. And it is a big atrium, a big open courtyard uh, in, in the sand, and they are, um, the floors, you, they are looking into the courtyard, and they literally drop the flyers into it. And they were caught by doing that, and they were caught uh, by guess who? By the janitor of the university. 
and the janitor, a, a janitor was a, um, a, a, was a, um, a party member, so he turned them in. And there were actually, the, uh, of course, the police were already looking for them for quite some time because uh, the, the, dis the distribution of the flyer didn't get unnoticed. There are actually uh, um, orders that are out there to, for them to, for, to bring them in, so people knew that. The Gestapo was looking for them? Yes, they, they, they were looking for them. Um, the first ones that got caught were, were the uh, sibling Scholl, Hans Scholl and uh, Sophie Scholl. And this is probably why they are uh, being so remembered on that, because they were the first one of the group that got, that got caught. Um, Alexander Schmoll tried to flee. And he actually tried to flee to Switzerland, but he had problems with his passport there. He had to return. And when he returned to Munich, he was recognized and being turned in. Well, and then, of course, the court process started. Well, what you're calling a court process. That was not a fair process as you are being used to here. If a total regime is in the charge of the courts, that's only what you can figure out there. And if you hear anything about the, uh, uh, um, the Bolshevik, uh, they had, well, it was similar only on the other on the other side. So all the group members were fairly certain they will get executed. And that is what happened. Uh, they, uh, the court decided fairly quickly um, that there were uh, traitors and, um, and that they're doing harm to the German, uh, fault, uh, the German um, uh, uh, citizen. And uh, so they were sentenced to death. Um, Alexander Schmarl wrote several letters uh, to his parents, and he uh, he considered uh, his uh, um, uh, the second wife of his mother, uh, basically his stepmom, uh, as as his mother. Actually, he uh, considered both of them as uh, the mother. And if you're reading the um, if you're reading the letter, um, that is his last letter that he wrote to to his parents. And um, if you're reading that letter, um, I honestly. I, when I prepared this talk, um, I read this letter today, and I read this letter many times before. But this is, of course, in the translation into English. Um, it, uh, um, it was uh, uh, written in German. Um, uh, every time if I read this letter, I, I'm, I'm tearing up. Because it shows you, and if you're reading all the letters, um, I think they have a lot um, there about uh, six, eight letters that he wrote to his parents over the time from April to July. And he always starts with, there's nothing to report, like nothing really changed. Well, what changes in prison? And, but then every letter, without any exception, every letter tells his parents, they should not worry. He is fine. He knows what is about to happen. There's nothing to worry about him. And that he, in his last letter, he even says, he's looking forward to it. And it will be much harder on them than it will be on him that he will be caught. And he wrote this last letter literally hours before he was executed. And you can say a lot about this the, this group, and of course uh, there are many uh, many groups, uh, political uh, organized groups, that try to um, uh, to take this group and, and make it their own group, uh, the, the White Rose group. So that, uh, they're part of us. They're for thinking like this, like any kind of rebels or any kind of different thinking groups or something that that are trying to 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 use that group and for, for their own purpose. But they're actually all, in, all missing the point. Because of, although not, as I said, they were only Alexander Schmoll was orthodox, but they were all motivated 
uh, by a deep sense of uh, spiritual conviction that what is going on is wrong, you have to do something about this, and you have to stand up. There is not, you can not sit silent there anymore. I can, you can find this letter online, of course, and I, if you want, I can give you a printout of that letter. Um, and also of the other letters, they were all translated in, into English. Um, and uh, it is it is very moving that uh, that it, uh, uh, if you calculate it, how old was Alexander Schmoll at that time? He was 25. So he was, in average, a little bit older than you guys, but not by much. But he had he was spiritually convinced that he is is doing the right right thing, and he was willing to die for it. And it was not an only a political motivation. It was a spiritual conviction to the motivation. And you see this even in, 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 a sentence, uh, in, in the flyers itself. Uh, you see it actually even uh, uh, in some things that uh, in, in other documents that, uh, that other members wrote. Uh, that they're always coming back to, the, coming back to that, what the real motivation is to be so against this. Uh, next slide. Uh, could you, one moment. The second to the last, end of the second to the last paragraph. One thing above all, let me leave this in your hearts. Never forget God. That yes. is what is written on his icon. Yes. Mm. Um, it, and it is, uh, this icon was uh, painted by Father Paul Kostrovsky. Um, a written, I should say, in the painting. And, uh, and I had it written in German. Uh, and the scroll is in German, and that, uh, that what you see on the scroll, that is exactly these last words on this, uh, of this letter. And it's really like a testament to, not to only to his parents, uh, that this letter was addressed. It is a testament to all of us. Yes. Father, um, how common was it for people in Nazi Germany to protest? Were there... Were there lots of people that uh, stood up and did this? No. Was it regular for people to be sent to prison and killed uh, for this? Uh, thank you, because this is, uh, again, one of these things that, that, uh, that uh, I took, took probably for granted. No, it was not common to do the, uh, that people did that. It was extremely uncommon that it is a sin. This is actually one of the rare occasions that, that something actually happened. There were little groups that tried something, but uh, there wasn't a uh, tried assassination to Hitler. Um, but that failed, and um, but uh, in the in the if you're working long enough on even on a on, on a large amount of population, you will numb these people. You can numb them, and basically they are just accepting. They are so afraid that something happens that the, to them that they are the, or to their family that they will be quiet, even if they're seeing things. It's not like you cannot say that everyone didn't see anything, but uh, many people, I, I will not say, I, I, I'm, I try to stay away from generalizing, and especially I try to stay, stay away from judging people. Um, I, the, uh, my grandmother that passed away, she was not a Nazi, um, but uh, uh, she was living during that time. and. The, um, and I asked her, and I said, uh, when I discovered uh, uh, in, in, in my teenage years what actually really happened at this time through history lessons and all that, I was in absolutely unbelief. How can you look the other way? How could you not know what, what is going on? And if you know about it, how could you not do something? Because that is the mentality how we're doing it normally today, that we're doing something. Hopefully, and uh, but my grandma tried to understand me, and she said I couldn't do anything. There was nothing that I could have done. But that's that's I cannot judge if that was true or not. But it was extremely difficult at that point, and it was very rare that uh, people did that, and especially it was very rare that young people did that. They had their whole life for it. If you're 25, you have your whole life for it. 
And they knew from the get-go, actually when that before the drop of the flyer in the University of Munich, there was a discussion in the group if they actually should do that because they knew that was high risk. Everything what they did was high risk, but nothing compared to that. Because there are so many people going in and out, even if they're doing this during a lesson, where they could suspect that no one is in, uh, roaming around at that point. Uh, it, well, and it, well, they were unfortunately Unfortunately or fortunately proven right. There was someone roaming around the gender. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, how is he? Was a firing squad or? No, uh, they were all uh, executed by the guillotine. Guillotine? Yeah. Yes. Wow. And they were executed in, uh, in the Munich prison. Uh, they, uh, they were all um, uh, transferred into that prison, and that uh, um, that prison is actually still existing uh, and in active, actively existing. I think I've seen a thing on TV about that, or some but like in France, especially they had guillotines, and yeah. 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 So, were how many uh, copies of these? did they make? You know, like 50 copies, yeah, it was, five copies, I mean, I know we know yeah. of six different letters that yes. they put uh, out. It, but it, um, uh, the first ones were the, uh, uh, a volume of 200 to 300, uh, the, the first flyers. Um, the, uh, oh, and there's one thing that I should mention. To say, uh, and that, that goes back to your question, were there people thinking differently and did they do something about it? There were actually people thinking differently and they are actually did, uh, did say something, and the one, there's one uh, a Roman Catholic bishop, von Galen, uh, who uh, famously actually used his pulpit uh, to preach a sermon, and actually several sermons, against what is happening. But he never, he preached against it, but he never told the people to do something about it, and to resist what is happening. And that was, is that very different in this group? They did not only tell, oh, this is wrong. They tell, you have to do something. You have to stand up. You, you read, you, the one that is reading this particular flight, you have to do that. You have to resist. You said there were six flyers. Like, did they basically say the same thing, or did they progressively get stronger they, in their message? They got progressively stronger. Uh, they had different authorships, different, different members of the group uh, authored different flyers. The last flyer was totally authored by uh, Professor Dr. Kurt Huber. Um, and the last, uh, I think it was the last or the, the fifth or the sixth flyer, um, they actually found wide distribution. Uh, they actually, uh, they made their work away uh, up to Hamburg and from Hamburg over to England. Um, and they got always multi uh, more copies, more copies, and uh, they were actually then being used even uh, um, when, uh, when, the, um, uh, when the English actually I, I came over uh, uh, and they were again distributed by them. So they were, uh, by, by, they were used by the Allies because they, they knew that this is, this is gold. And this is not us saying us from the outside, from another country telling you you're doing what, your own people telling you you're wrong. Oh, uh, the last line, I should say something, uh, can you go back? Yeah. The last line, it says, with me goes Professor Huber, who also sends you his most hot feeling felt reason. Sounds like, almost like a, um, a, a normal ending of a letter, but you really have to remind yourself when this was written, that it was hour before his execution, and when he said, with me goes Professor Huber, uh, uh, it actually refers that he will be executed at the end. So... Uh, next slide. So I'll give you some visual impressions. Um, I was living in Munich. Uh, I was living in Munich for 15 years. Uh, I was not born there. Um, but um, uh, I gave you a little reference where I was living. That was actually like there in the, uh, in the middle there. Um, it's more to the south of Munich. Um, our, uh, the cathedral of the Russian church of, uh, 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 wrote, uh, is uh, to the right, the right bubble. And then there is uh, a, a, a place now called a street, uh, a, what 
uh, square, that's what he called it, uh, called Schmorgelplatz. So he's, it's named after Alexander Schmorgel. Um, the picture I've loved there, um, actually, you gave me a pointer, did you? <laughs> um, so the, uh, this one is actually the, the cathedral uh, in Munich. Um, and this uh, is actually the courtyard in front of the university. Uh, um, and you see what uh, it is called uh, Geschwister Scholz, uh, plus it's, uh, the sibling Scholz of uh, Square. So uh, that, that university remembers very much so what, what happened there. Um, uh, next slide. Um, they actually did, um, uh, they created a memorial at the university uh, by taking these flyers and they actually, it looks like dropped flyers on the floor uh, and uh, it is actually like um, uh, uh, just a memorial right directly on the floor, you can literally walk over it. Uh, but this is how the flyers were, they were just dropped out. Um, and this one is actually not a flyer, this uh, is uh, the newspaper clip uh, of, uh, when, um, uh, uh, when the members of the right rules were executed. And this one, is, that gives you now the visual impression how it looks inside the university where it actually a last flyer drop happened. Uh, and uh, it, you see it is like a valley, it's a big staircase going on there. But you can literally picture them staying up there up the staircase and dropping down the flyers. But again, they, were not, they didn't expect that there are any people at that time, and mostly it was uh, vacant at that point. But they were watched while they were doing that. So you can uh, 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 picture the fire world going, going on there, and then the, uh, the, um, the lesson stops, and all people leaving their classrooms, uh, and then they're finding the fire. Um, um, this is actually at the glorification um, of the Diocese of Munich. Um, uh, 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 as you see, uh, that is Mladi Gamak, uh, that forgot. Which metropolitan is that? I think he's from Rodney Rock. I don't, I don't remember that. Yeah. When did that happen? Uh, that happened last year. Uh, this, this spring? This, this spring, this in spring. February. Uh, the February 12th of mm -hmm. this year. Um, and uh, sorry that the uh, um, uh, pictures are turning out so dark. I was hoping that you would see a little bit better. Um, uh, what is remarkable about this picture, uh, this is not uh, the, uh, uh, the grave of Alexander Schmoll. Uh, this is actually the grave of the um, uh, uh, sister, uh, uh, the siblings Scholl. Uh, and when, when they, uh, uh, they did a, a, a great procession, a glorification, uh, the, the glorification basically starts with uh, having a last panapir um, as a, a person being glorified. And uh, uh, he was buried uh, at the cemetery, but is pretty much right behind the cathedral. That, was, that is his original resting place. So there's really God pro God's providence that he was, uh, he was buried right what is now our cathedral. <laughs> um, and um, so when you walk from the cathedral to the grave, it's like, I'd say, a five minute walk. Um, uh, and they did a big procession, and you pass a lot a, 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 a site that uh, the uh, the resting place of um, the uh, Hans Scholl and Sophie Scholl. Um, they stopped there and uh, they said a prayer and uh, you know lit, lit a candle uh, for them. Um, but it found was a very touching um, uh, gesture. Um, then this uh, this one here that is the last resting place of Alexander Schmorl. And that is when they uh, celebrated the last Panapita. And that is at the glorification itself, uh, when the icon was being brought out uh, during the vigil service at the, um, uh, at the uh, magnification. Father, you said that was the last resting place. Were they buried elsewhere and then moved? No, like, they were never moved. They, 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 this, uh, sorry. Who buried? Did the Nazis bury them? Yes, they did. Even though they were against well, the, the regime? Well, that was, I think, uh, our cathedral was converted from a, a military barrack. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Our cathedral was converted from a military barrack. Oh, yes. that makes more sense. Okay. Yeah. Wow. It was originally, uh, yeah, uh, and then 
uh, it, it, it happened to be that that military power, of course, uh, 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 right across that cemetery. So. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, and this, I think this is the last slide that I have. Um, this is a very interesting picture. Um, because and I think, for me, um, this always, um, these kind of pictures making saints for me more lively. And uh, uh, Vika can certainly attest to that, having uh, lived with a saint, um, uh, San Juan of San Francisco. Um, uh, it is, saints are not something, sometimes saints for us are so disconnected. They're, they're something that happened a long time ago and uh, probably never happened again or something like that. But here you see actually um, that they are members of the Schmoll family um, and uh, they, uh, they are also in conversation uh, uh, with this guy here and he is actually uh, a, a friend of Alexander Schmoll. He, at that uh, uh, time he was 91 year old, uh, 19, uh, 91 year old, uh, years old. Um, and um, and his, uh, he, was, he was actually asked at that trapezer, that is the trapezer after the Divine Liturgy, after the glorification, and the people around uh, him, uh, they, uh, they asked him, they said, what is, what is he thinking about uh, what is happening today? I mean, this was his friend, and now his friend is a saint. And, um, and uh, his reply was, today is a good day. <laughs> um, so, <coughs> Uh, no, he is not. So he may be not exactly, really, fully understand. Yeah, yeah. he understood. I, I think he understood. Yeah. But, I, uh, I but if you're afraid of something, <laughs> then he is the same. I mean, how do you deal with that? <laughs> and, Good connections. Uh, uh, and um, he is actually the, um, uh, uh, he is actually the one. Um, who gave him, uh, when he tried to escape to, to, to flee to Switzerland, Alexander Schmoll tried to flee to Switzerland, he tried to give uh, gave him a Bulgarian passport, um, and uh, he gave him 100 marks. Um, um, and uh, how this whole thing actually failed was that he was not, uh, of course, going, he was going by foot. Um, they could not use any public uh, train or something like that, because that was for sure that he would det be detected. Um, he was walking around with foot, but it was winter at that point, and he was not adequate uh, clothes, so he had to return. Um, uh, on the right side, uh, that would be, yeah, this is this person. Um, uh, that is uh, Alexander Schmorl's niece, um, Alexa Bush, and she is a, a, a nurse living in Sorry. But that is the last slide anyway. Um, so, coming back to why, why do I tell you all that? And I hope it came a little bit across, but I want to spell this out. Um, to be, uh, to cherish what we're calling liberty today, but liberty is something different. Liberty. Uh, is not, you can do whatever you want to do. Uh, liberty is uh, to live, uh, in, in our case, to live a Christian life, to, li to, live, uh, to, to live as a Christian, to follow the, uh, the law of God, uh, to, uh, to work on our salvation. Um, that, that is liberty. And that can be taken at any time away from us. And um, and if you recognize that, that this is happening, you cannot sit silent. You have to do something about that. But Alexander Alexander Schmoll was, uh, was glorified as a martyr. Well, martyr, does, that means in English to be a witness. That's what the word martyr means, to be a witness. And to, uh, to be a witness, to be willing to be a witness, to pay even to be witness with your own blood. With your own life and blood. That far, how that, uh, does that go? And I think you as young people have to understand that we, you're living here in a country 
that has all kinds of liberties. But they have the, the, a kind of liberty, you can then do whatever you want to do. But it has to be conformed to that liberty. And sometimes liberty says also, no, you cannot do that. And, um, and that is always in danger of being taken away from us at any time. And by God's grace, we have it at this point that we can be Christians here, that we can sit together here in this room. That, that's by God's grace that we did have that, that, that opportunity. But we do not know how long we have that and how it is being taken away from us. I don't want to scare you. <laughs> but it is, it, there's always a possibility. And that you can, and, and St. Alexander Schmoll is showing you that you as young people have to have at some point the, um, the wisdom um, guided by God uh, to, to stand up and say, not only saying, oh, this is wrong, then in telling your neighbor, we have to do something about it. That's what, what the, the big difference in this group is. I, tell, I said, that they did not only say this is wrong, they told everyone of their fellow uh, 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 of their fellow people that they were living with, you, we all have to do something against it. And this is why that was extremely dangerous in that regime. Because imagine, and, and somehow it did work at, at eventually, but imagine that would have worked earlier. How much could have been prevented? And this is why this group was so forcefully, and that they had to be executed, because they were dangerous to this regime. If they are succeeding to, uh, to wake only a couple of people up and then goes right, it has this ripple effect. It would have, it have, it would have certainly changed uh, things. But by God's, by God's grace, it was d a different. But on the other side, by God's grace, we have a new saint now. Yeah. I just want to point one thing out. Father mentioned Martha. It's a Greek word that means witness, but an active witness who is willing to stand up for what he believes unto death. So a witness is, doesn't necessarily have to die a martyr's death. Many martyr saints died their own death. Saint Alexandra, the uh, wife of uh, Diocletian, Sophia, the mother of Vera Nadir's de Livor, faith, hope, uh, uh, and uh, love. She died her own death, but she was willing to you know, stand up for her beliefs Unto, unto death. And why I mention this, because now the word martyr is being given a completely new meaning and a wrongful meaning. Uh, terrorists are called the martyrs. Mm -hmm. It's wrong. That is not what martyr means. You know, these terrorists who blow up, uh, you know, throw bombs into shopping malls or what have you, you know, especially in the Near East, they're martyrs. No, that is not what the word martyr means. A martyr is someone who himself witnesses the truth unto death. He doesn't kill others. Well, and I think he's a perfect example for yes. that. Because um, uh, even in the flyers, this whole group said, yes, you have to do something. But they didn't go up uh, and, and blew or shot people. That's not what they did. But they were willing to die for it. And if, you, if you're reading the letters, uh, if you, and I, I'm willing, I, I would be very happy to, to, to give you a copy of, of all the letters that he wrote to, the, to his parents. Uh, you see it, uh, that he was willing to die. He was ready. And, it is, and, they, and they thought there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. He, in one letter he said, by God's grace, he, I will not be executed. But if it, if it uh, will be okay, I'm okay. Well, no, because they're not orthodox. They're not, at least not, not in the Well, we... Uh, when... I should put it this way. Any forced death for the truth, St. John Chrysostom says, is towards for the person's good, for his salvation. But when the Orthodox Church glorifies a saint, we don't say that the other people are not worthy. We can only vouch for those that belong to us. The, the uh, uh, Sophia and Hans, what is the last name? Uh, Scholl. 
So, are they in heaven? Let's hope so. And I'm sure God, but we can only answer for those who belong to the Orthodox Church as Orthodox Bishop. So we are telling you, Alexander Shmarl, he is an example for us to follow. And as such, you know, he is, we glorify him. Are the others? We hope so. But there are many more saints. That, yes, that but are the we can, as Orthodox Church, we can only vouch or set examples of those who belong to us. Father, why did they pick the name White Rose? Uh, that's a good question. And um, and actually, uh, while they were already in person, there were uh, Hans Scholl was asking uh, about that, and he said. There's actually not really a reason behind it. <laughs> um, because the people are thinking that uh, there's some, some mystic uh, the, uh, meaning behind this. And he literally said, no, I was looking about a name that people can remember and that they'll remember a message with. That is all what I was looking for. And uh, he, actually, he said, I did read, uh, read a book, um, I forgot what it was, and that, uh, there, there was a reference to, uh, to the white rose, uh, the white roses, and, and he thought, oh, this is very fitting, and so he chose that. So uh, there is no bigger concept behind it, mm -hmm. other than the concept of you have to remember. And that is actually, I mean, that's actually what we're calling now good public relation. You just have to remember it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Doesn't matter what you remember, but you have to remember. You know, those uh, talking about, you know, say, those teachers who, that one teacher at least in uh, Newtown, who, you know, ushered the children into a, a closet and herself went out and faced the killer and she said, oh, they're out in gym. And she was killed. She, you know, she laid her life, of course. But it's, if she's Catholic, it's up to the Catholic Church, you know, to, is she in heaven? Oh, I'm 100% sure, but it's up to the Catholic Church to glorify her, if she was Catholic or whatever. You know. Well, the, the, I, and even for the Orthodox, I would say, well, there are many Orthodox people, in, and hopefully in heaven, and they are the glorified saints. Um, well, <laughs> see, be Otherwise, you're righteousness, godliness, <laughs> righteousness, and holiness, sanctity, sviatis, are two different things. Not everyone in heaven is a saint because there are different categories. Uh, sanctity is someone so close to God that through him we can intercede God and he can beseech God and, you know, sort of pass down grace. You know, there are people who just probably just barely make it to heaven. I mean, uh, <laughs> but they're not saints. So it's, there are different categories.
what he stood up for as an Orthodox Christian. You know, looking in today's society right now, for ourselves as Orthodox Christians, you know, don't answer this out loud at all. Just something to think about maybe and take away. But what would what's going on that we as Orthodox Christians would be called to... Be true to yourself. Yeah. Stand up and... Just be true to yourself. Don't do something that you, you know, your conscience, uh, you know, forbids you. And we're constantly, oftentimes, not constantly, but very often, we're asked to do something. Uh, you know, just if you're something against your conscience, don't do it. You know, you don't have to be. You don't want to be unloving about it. Right. And the church does not right. call us to look for death, but it does call us to stand up for the truth. So in other words, you shouldn't be going out looking to die. <laughs> but if it happens that you have to stand up for the truth, then you should. Well, maybe maybe think each one of you, you know, clear for St. Alexander, he got to a point where he was out of step with his society. There was the Nazi regime, there was Hitler, and everything that they were standing for. And he understood that his core beliefs were not that. As Orthodox Christians in America today, what is it that we and the Church and our beliefs are out of step with society as a whole? How do each one of us in our daily lives have to be, in a sense, our own, keep our own convictions, be our own witnesses, as opposed to what society as a whole says? Can anybody think of any concrete examples, things that you have to say, no, you know, society says this is legal, this is okay, or even if it says it's not legal, my friends are doing it. What is it that you have to say, no, this is not me, this is not what I, as an Orthodox Christian, do? When, when do you have to arise to that challenge? <laughs> so, what? He has a question. Any, anybody have, yeah? Maybe like when everyone's saying just be like everyone else, you know, fit in and all that. If everyone's like everyone else, who would be special? Right. So we don't have to necessarily be the same as everybody? I mean, so many kids are like that. They're so worried. It's like, be yourself. Because that's just later in life, no one's going to care how popular you were, you know. Well, can you think of anything, and I'm, I'm thinking of some particular moral issues in the country that Drugs. may approach you, may be something you have to consider. Yeah. Yep. A gangster doing something like, illegal. Well, not just a gangster, like just a group Honestly, of bad people that like, don't, like, that, that shouldn't be you. You're an Orthodox Christian. You know how to act. Well, so at some point, the friend is going to say, hey, you know, we're going over and we're going to do something. And you kind of understand what it is that's going to happen. And you have to say, sorry, I'm, I'm not going to go. Right? You have to be able to stand up. Yeah? Um, probably gay marriage because it's legal, but it's not right. Yet. So... You yourself may be asked at some point to say, well, I, I don't share that belief that this is a right, this is not my faith that we should have gay marriage. Can you think of anything else? Because there's a couple of, there's one big issue I'm thinking of that that may confront all of you. Yeah? Is it abortion? That's one of, that's, that's what I was thinking of. How would that ever affect any of you? Because, like, you're just basically, like, wasting somebody's life, like they could be like someone, a big role in history, but you're just not giving them a chance. So, in what concrete way would each one of you ever have to stand up about an abortion? It's, it's legal in America, there are abortion clinics, there's funding out there to support this. When would you ever have to do something in response? Yeah? Yeah, yeah you were first. Okay, Anna? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to say that if, like, you shouldn't have abortion. If you don't want a kid, just give him up for orphanage or something. Just don't kill it. Okay, so maybe that's an argument yeah. you could yeah. explain to somebody, you need, right? You need to make sure, sure yeah. so. Oh, like, you make sure to, like, not, uh, not, uh, um, lead up, not be involved in, um... Intercourse? Yeah, like in, in such interactions that will lead up to for you to even make that decision. Like you just gotta 
steer clear. In other words, what, what is a Christian point? approach to marriage. Yeah. That. And a Christian approach to dating, to getting to know somebody. Right? And this is one of the ways in which each one of you has Morals. to be strong and say, you know, movies, uh, videos, uh, whatever you read about the superstars in, in Hollywood, all of that's going to say, get to know somebody, go to bed, wake up the next morning, uh, go for a photo shoot, whatever they do, right? <laughs> this is as if to say, this is the great thing to do. But you have to say, sorry, this is not what I'm going to do, right? Because we understand that this is one of the potential consequences that somebody could get pregnant. But I'm personally thinking that each one of you will also have potentially a friend. God willing, each one of you will understand how to save yourself, how to be uh, attentive to these issues. But you might have a friend who comes to you and says, I have something terrible that just happened. You know, I was out with my friend, and da 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 da, da one thing like the next, and now suddenly I think I'm pregnant. Right? So you may be called at some point to try and encourage someone to be their advisor, at least help be a conscience for them. They may not understand that there is another option. Right? So these are all sorts of things. Can you think of anything else that's happening in the broad world? We'll but I just want to say it doesn't necessarily have to be something so drastic for you to witness your faith. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, your friend coming and saying that she's pregnant. Uh, but just being orthodox. I mean, you don't have to stand there in the street corner and advertise it, but, you know, <laughs> before a meal, cross yourself. Can you an example? Set an example. You, you know, just, or after a meal, cross yourself. And true, your true friends will actually respect you for it. Like in school, it's not like um, a professor at a church asked us, is it cool to be like, even Christian, not even Orthodox, but to be Christian in school, and it's like, it's not, it's but not. It, but this is where we're saying that, yeah. like Alexander, we have Alexander, well, somewhere you have to decide, well, either I give in to peer pressure, or, you know, I'm an Orthodox Christian, why do I yeah. have to, you know, just because this little yeah. teacher is saying something, what, yeah. I mean, you only have to challenge him, but you oh, yourself yeah. remain true to who you are. Yet we have to, as I like to say, beat your, our own drum. <laughs> okay, let's start it up. I'll try in Russian because it will be hard, in, because it will be difficult for me. And it would very diff might be difficult for you to understand my Russian. Uh, so the question is, how, could, uh, how should Orthodox uh, young men and women uh, behave in school and with each other. Uh, are you speaking about this? Yes. yes. In, in Russia, for example, there's a big problem. Everybody is, uh, for example, cursing all the time. А ты другой, ты этого не должен делать. И как тебе быть самому убежденным в том, что ты не должен потакать всем и подражать им? Потому что это не модно, ты сразу как будто не такой белая ворона. You're uh, like a, a white uh, raven who sticks out as somebody unusual. If you do that. <laughs> <laughs> you can take, uh, Ношу крест или я крещусь перед едой, перед всеми не стесняюсь. Потому что будет противоречие, если я крещусь перед едой, но при этом я матерюсь как они, тогда в чем смысл твоего христианства? Uh, the disbalance that these things contradict each other to behave in that way. This is number one. And the second is the relationship between young boys and young men and women in classes. In this age, your age, very often there's an attempt to uh, fall in love, to flirt. And some people get 
влюбленность это от Бога или нет? Uh, there's a, even a question uh, that he, Father gets, he answers questions on internet sites, and so sometimes the question gets posed to Father about is uh, falling in falling in love this way uh, something from God or not? Вот на примере России скажу, что очень многие делают ошибки, путая понятие влюбленности с любовью, потому что девушка, как известно, учит, слышит, любит ушами. Вот. Если ей сказать, да, ничего. Если сказать, что я тебя люблю, она это примет за чистую монету, а потом парень пользуется этой ее простотой, непонимание, что для него люблю, это значит, я хочу обладать тобой, а не мне ты мне не нужна, мне нужно твое тело. So there is a, a confusion that arises between the phrase of uh, falling in love and love itself. And so often if a young uh, man will say to a uh, young girl that I love you, she will accept that as a, use the phrase, a pure coin, that is the truth. Well, that's just the opposite. If she says it to him. Uh, she says it to him. No, he says it to him to her. Это мальчик говорит девочке. Мальчик говорит девочке. А девочка любит сына. So the young young man says this to the girl, and she accepts it as the honest truth that indeed he does love И тут бывает много ошибок, потому что девочка позволяет себя поцеловать, позволяет себя обнять, и потом отсюда вот те проблемы, о которых мы уже дальше говорим, а что сделать, чтобы не было абортов? And so at this point there arises the question, because then the girl allows herself to have kisses, to have intimate physical relation, and that leads to all the other problems about when we start with the question of what we do about abortion. Вот моей дочке 15, я могу, как сказать, на ее примере, Когда мы говорим об этом, как правильно относиться друг к другу в таких вот ситуациях, то у нас есть некая договоренность внутри себя, у нее это уже есть, это она уже созрела в этом, что я никому не имею права позволить коснуться себя до свадьбы. She has the internal conviction that there, that no one has the right uh, to uh, approach her, to touch her until the wedding. Вот один из способов это представлять, что девушка и парень это огонь и бумага, поэтому вместе они могут только в одном случае, если женятся. Uh, one of the ways to think about this is to imagine a young man and a girl as a paper and fire, and if they get together. <laughs> what happens, and it's only appropriate uh, that that happen after. Не обязательно проверять, не обязательно постель. Это это не как место для проверки, насколько ты любишь другого. В России вот в России древние времена девушку нельзя было поцеловать до свадьбы, и ее если вдруг это происходит, называли поцелованной. И за такую никогда не брали жены. So. Uh, the bed is not a place to test if a relationship is uh, appropriate or a good one. Um, and in olden times in Russia, uh, there was, uh, it was traditional that uh, you would not uh, kiss until after the wedding. And that if a girl allowed herself to be kissed, then she would be known as one who had been kissed. <laughs> and uh, for such girls, uh, there was not interest in marrying. У моего папы было девять детей, и он мне говорил, во-первых, что если ты созрел до отношений каких-то, то давай сделаем все для того, чтобы у тебя была та одна единственная навсегда. My father is uh, has nine children. And uh, he said that if you have matured to the point that you're ready for a relationship, then uh, it's appropriate uh, to, to test that, to uh, have it develop so that you only have one such relationship.